Because college football traces its origins to Christian institutions, the sport has followed a parallel path towards secularization, thus demonstrating that a preeminent American popular culture phenomenon is at its hearth a Christian cultural phenomenon. This is demonstrated by the evolution of the Princeton versus Rutgers, the contestants of the first ever football game, series. We are starting off here at the University of Pennsylvania, of which John Heisman, the namesake for the trophy of the most outstanding collegiate football player, was an alumnus. The mascot of Penn's football team are the Quakers, an ironically pacifist Christian religious movement that started in England as a form of Protestantism in the 17th century, whose practitioners settled in New England, as well as Pennsylvania, which was specifically founded as a haven for the persecuted sect. Frederick Rudolph described Penn's Ivy League fellow member Harvard, the first institution of higher learning in what would become the United States by stating, the two cardinal principles of English Puritanism, which most profoundly affected the social development of New England and the United States, were not religious tenets, but educational ideals. A learned clergy and a lettered people, thus central to these ideals, was the development of Harvard College, the college which would train the schoolmasters, the divines, the rulers, the cultural ornaments of society, the men who would spell the difference between civilization and barbarism. Yale College soon after proceeded to make a place for itself in the elite rank of American higher education by actually becoming what Harvard professed to be, a safe, sound institution where the faith of the fathers was carefully protected. Thus, the first ever college rivalry was a spiritual one, steeped in doctrine and academic in nature at that. The trend towards secularization was the religious colonial college was quite was quiet but became early. The College of Philadelphia was founded by Benjamin Franklin and other notable trustees in a building that housed the academy that had originally been set up in 1740, a charity school supporting the ministry of George Whitefield with a hall for Whitefield to preach in. Franklin, however, wanted to ensure its use was broader. Both house and ground were vested in trustees, expressly for the use of any preacher of any religious persuasion who might desire to say something to the people at Philadelphia. The design in the building was not to accommodate any particular sect, but the inhabitants in general, so that even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send a missionary to preach Mohammedism to us, he would find a pulpit at his service. With the blessing of Benjamin Franklin at the College of Philadelphia, now known as the University of Pennsylvania, Scotch-born provost William Smith created a three-year course of study. With as much as a third of the curriculum being dedicated to science and practical studies, that according to Rudolph became the first systemic course in America not deriving from medieval tradition nor intending to serve a religious purpose. Accordingly, the founding board of the College of Philadelphia would be the first ever to contain no ministers, a harbinger. Rudolph found that one faction of the widely split Presbyterians of the middle colonies witnessed the development of Harvard and Yale and sought to create a college of their own. Subsequently, these Presbyterians in 1746 would charter the College of New Jersey at Princeton. Princeton, as the college became to be known, as you can see behind me, was a product of the great religious awakening of the 18th century. There would be nine colleges in what is now the United States at the start of the American Revolution, and by the start of the Civil War, there would be approximately 250. One reason for the founding of so many colleges was the federal system of states, complete with their provincial loyalties and rivalries. Another reason the United States would become the land of colleges was the home missionary movement, which after 1800 concentrated its attention in the West. Frequently, Yale men were responsible for setting up the Christian goals of the West, but they had a great deal of help from the Princetonians. Often, the genesis of these rivalries, bickering, and controversies between colleges was denominational in nature. Initially, prayer and church service attendance was compulsory in American colleges, but the gradual abandonment of compulsion during the second half of the 19th century was clearly a response to the fact that this compulsion did not work. As the 19th century wore on, the United States became more and more urban and the pious presidents of the city colleges became bolder and thought grander. Yet, everywhere there lingered the belief that life was sounder, more moral, and more character building where the college was nestled amongst the hills or planted in the prairie. A massive college reform movement arose in the 19th century. Thomas Jefferson, the apostle of the Enlightenment, founded the University of Virginia, which was divided into eight schools ancient languages, modern languages, mathematics, natural philosophy, natural history, anatomy, and medicine, moral philosophy, 
and law. This conceptual university would now be the model to which the American college would aspire. This reform movement, now complete with its dormitories filled with men, saw colleges take on the dual responsibility of educating its students and having to house them. With these colleges, mostly non-urban and in far-flung areas, there was a dearth of non-academic pursuits to occupy their time away from their professors and studies. As a result, the American University saw itself charged with providing recreation to these students and recreation that was morally uplifting. Hi, we're in front of Nassau Hall on the campus of Princeton University, founded by the Presbyterian sect. Denominationalism was often a weight on the economic prospects of the early college and remote locations were a contributing factor as well. Probably the financial insecurity of the colleges and an unfavorable public image initiated the growing preference for mercantile and professional men over clergymen to serve on boards of regents and trustees. Even state institutions initially had considerable representation of clergy on their boards, but the first ever board of regents at the University of Michigan in 1837 had no clergymen, and for the first 15 years of the institution, the number of clergymen on its board membership would never eclipse a quarter. This was a foreboding sign. And since, except in the case of state universities, most college governing boards were self-perpetuating, once a preference for businessmen was expressed, then only charter provisions or sentiment could maintain a sizable clerical representation on the board. More often, it did not. Institutions more readily identified with a religious denomination than with a state increasingly lost popularity as objects of public support. After the Civil War, states discovered more proper educational outlets for their generosity, namely the state universities and federally endowed agricultural and mechanical colleges. Also, after the Civil War, the colleges found new means of supporting amongst their alumni and among a crop of especially affluent millionaire benefactors. The day of public support had ended and arose the concept of the private college. Trustee power, however, was not unlimited. Much of their authority was necessarily delegated to college presidents, and much of that was actually appropriated by the students. This board secularization movement paralleled in the first half of the 19th century the fraternity movement that swept through American colleges, and it also became decidedly anti-religious. This fall from grace was facilitated by the recognition that the fraternity movement gave to secular values good looks, good clothes, good family, and good income. The attainment of these good looks would come from the discovery of physical development. The Puritan ethic objected to the kind of frivolity that and play associated with the outdoor gymnasium. However, institutions were effectively powerless to stop the fraternity movement and the organization of sports teams. As students were clamoring for physical recreation, in order to foster morally grounded recreation, American universities embraced muscular Christianity. In tracing the rise of muscular Christianity, Putney indicates that many 19th century America's sporting innovations occurred at colleges, and it was at Yale, the first ever college sports team, a rowing club was formed in 1843. Harvard, Brown, Dartmouth, Trinity, and Pennsylvania would soon follow, and in 1852, the first ever intercollegiate sporting competition was held. The New York Times commented in 1860 with some approval that with steady preaching of the school of muscular Christianity during the past few years, the human body has attained to a dignity and importance in the eyes of instructors of youth. Collins notes that although this belief in muscular Christianity traces its origins as a form of British nationalism, it provided a framework into which other forms of nationalism could be inserted and found especially fertile ground across the United States as nationalism was substituted for the parochialism that existed in the rivalries between colleges. Putney identifies other collegiate firsts as including Amherst building of an indoor gymnasium in 1860, the spread of baseball in the 1860s, and development of track, but notably the development of American football in the 1870s. 20 years after the chartering of Princeton and only a year after the Baptists founded the College of Rhode Island at Providence, now Brown University, an academic rival institution to Princeton within New Jersey entered the fray. Seeking autonomy, the Dutch Reformed Church founded Queens College in New Brunswick to train its own ministers and to educate the youth in language, liberal, the divinity, and useful arts and sciences. Queens College would come to be the second oldest college in New Jersey and the eighth oldest college in all of what is now the United States. 
true to form. After persistent financial troubles and two closings in the first half of the, of the century of existence, Queens College renamed itself after philanthropist, board of trustee member, and benefactor Henry Rutgers, a Revolutionary War hero who epitomized Christian values according to the board. It would be here at this site, at Rutgers, when this, when this gymnasium was just a field that the first ever American football game would be played against their arch rival Princeton in 1869. Although it took a few years for the game to catch on, the growth of the sport of collegiate football in the 1870s was absolutely extraordinary. Few movements so captured colleges and universities, and football was so widely adopted and adopted so quickly that for the first time since the founding of Harvard College in 1636, colleges began to recognize the existence of intercollegiate relations. In 1873, the president of Cornell spurned a challenge from the University of Michigan to play a game in Cleveland by telegraphing, I will not permit 30 men to travel 400 miles merely to agitate a bag of wind. Only eight years later, the University of Michigan football team traveled east and played Harvard, Yale, and Princeton in the period of less than a week. Also in this same year on November 10th, the New York Times coverage of the princeton Rutgers rivalry game put the newness of the sport on display. It is clear from this article that football had not yet fully entered the national consciousness, perhaps not even the regional consciousness, as terms such as kickoff, touchdown, place kick, marked, offside, running, and tackling were all displayed in quotation marks, leading me to surmise that the sport is not yet popular enough that these contemporarily familiar football terminologies would have been enough of Carmen Par Parlance in 1881 to not warrant the writer to highlight these concepts. The presence of mascots had not yet even appeared as the teams were only distinguished by the colors the players uh, were wearing in their jerseys. Princeton being the orange and blacks and Rutgers being the boys in scarlet. By the late 1800s, some academics began to embrace football and the prototypical intercollegiate sport and these academics saw athletics as the way that increasingly large rational universities could train young men's bodies, minds, and morals for modern life. As the first contact sport to be wildly popular with young men in America, football satisfied the values of muscular Christianity that under the pop cultural force of Theodore Roosevelt's America took the secular name of the strenuous life. Football was seen as a democratizing force stemming the rising tide of the number of rich men's sons in American colleges and at minimum, football did not find itself out of line with many other collegiate values. Yale alumnus Walter Camp is considered to be the father of American football. After Camp, probably the most influential figure in the formative period of American football is Amos Alonzo Stagg, another Yale product who embodied the unity of Christian ideals in sport, being a graduate of the Divinity School and a seminal coach with the University of Chicago. Supporters of football within colleges everywhere were quick to point out how much the essential ideas of the old colleges were actually being served. At Yale, a faculty committee in 1902 pointed out that football captured the old evangelical ideal of selflessness. And the sport also appeared to reduce the incidences of rebellion, rioting, and hazing on college campuses. However, it became abundantly clear that the presence of football was clearly more effective than a faculty discipline committee or compulsory morning chapel. Lawrence Vasey believed that Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Cornell, and in their own way Yale and Princeton had stood for distinct educational alternatives. But during the 1890s, in a very real sense, the American academic establishment had lost its freedom. To succeed in building a major university, one now had to conform to the standard structure pattern in all basic aspects. A competitive market for money, students, faculty, and prestige dictated the avoidance of any pronounced eccentricities. By 1910, the American university had assumed its stable 20th century form. So even though the founders and first generation of football players were steeped in Christian ethos, alas, the seeds of the trend toward secularization of football alongside its secularizing institutions were sown. When the apparatus of athletics became too large and complex for student management, and when the expenditure of time and money became too hard to recruit, coach, feed, and care for these newfound athletic heroes and football programs at too large of a sum, alumni of these colleges left at the opportunity which student ineffectiveness and faculty indifference gave them. Later, 
When many faculties realized what happened, it was too late to reel the alumni, and by extension the football programs, in. The older alumni, nurtured on a tradition of collegiate rivalry rooted in a now waning denominational fervor or often in nothing more than substantial uh, than a competition for football or enrollment, found in football a new outlet for their loyalty. The October 5, 1911 New York Times coverage of the princeton Rutgers rivalry game was located in my research, and it was exactly 30 years, well, one month, one month short, after the first game coverage analyzed in the present research. The beginning of this article makes it a point to describe Princeton and Rutgers as the exponents of American collegiate football in 1869. This is a clear indicator that cultural homage is paid to these two institutions as the founder of the sport, and this is common knowledge by 1911. The coverage of the game itself was not remarkable. This was a clearly a one-sided affair after Princeton handily won 37 to nothing by treating 3,000 spectators to a dazzling array of forward passes, fake more formations, and line shifts. What is remarkable about the article is how in, if, of how indicative of how much the contest played spectacularly uh, resembles the modern game of football. No quotation marks around terminology is necessary now. Clearly, by 1911, the reader is familiar with the rules and concepts of the game. What resembles a modern box score, complete with the lineup of Princeton's offense and scoring capsule are present. This game is also not notable because the 1911 contest was the first game played between Ru Princeton and Rutgers after a 15-year hiatus. The series was halted by Rutgers due to a lack of competitiveness on the field. According to the New York Times, the Princeton Rutgers series would be halted again in 1915 until it resumed in 1933. Perhaps this was done away too hastily on the part of Rutgers. I'm standing here at Paul Robeson Plaza. In 1915, Paul Robeson enrolled at Rutgers. He was only the third ever African-American Rutgers student and was the only African-American student at Rutgers at his time. He would go on to be a two-time consensus All-American football player, as well as his class valedictorian. Also in 1915, a banner year, was when the University of Pittsburgh became the first football team to ever put numbers on the backs of jerseys so gridiron heroes could be identified from the stands. It became clear football was now a game for the players themselves, or not for the players themselves, but for the spectators. The school colors for colleges were largely chosen early on by baseball teams, but it was football that would bring out the mascots, banners, songs, and the carnival of the sport. Needing large enough accommodations to hold this spectacle, the widespread building of massive football stadiums occurred in the 1920s. Early football coaches were invariably young, recent graduates who were proficient in the sport and rose to the level of civic heroes and became highly profaned professional employees of colleges as football tended to be the only enterprise claimed by a college that actually turned a monetary profit. By this era, football became uncoupled from the archetypical university inner dynamics between faculty and administrators as the progressive movement secularized the missions of most major institutions and further pushed Christianity to the margins perhaps only best represented by individual departments or at best schools and colleges within the large university. After a decline in enrollment brought on by the Great Depression, football game attendance rebounded by 1935. By 1937, three quarters of American households had at least one radio. The now powerful Madison Avenue advertising agencies viewed intercollegiate athletics and its spectators as a media market to be exploited and newspaper publishers also profited from the lucrative market. Coaches, athletic directors, college presidents, boards of trustees, and alumni associations were all complicit in this money-making endeavor. During the interwar period, colleges and universities became famous for the grandeur of their architecture and big-time sports. They became equally notorious for the hedonistic behavior of their students and alumni spawned by homecomings, commencement reunions, proms, and year-round fraternity celebrations, all replete with alcohol. This was coupled with college students being at the forefront of pop culture fashions of their day. With the acceleration of colleges having gone co-educational starting in the 1850s, the college woman as a socialite was also a phenomenon that spread to all regions of the country by the 1930s as well. New York Times coverage of the 1938 Princeton Rutgers game, noted as football's first ever foes, which was to be held in Rutgers' new stadium, described how fraternity houses and dormitories on campus were decorated with elaborate displays today, all featuring the opening of the new stadium and warnings to the Tiger, Princeton's mascot, 
that the end is at hand in his domination of the Scarlet in 33 games since the first contest of intercollegiate football was played between the two teams on November 6, 1869. New Brunswick too assumed a festive appearance. The main streets were hung with flags and bunting and store windows were decorated to honor the occasion. By now, most of American society had some notion of the importance of college and its extracurriculars as a dominant institution. The concept of going to college was fully entrenched in American culture and the machinations that came in tow were fully tolerated because of the high level of social mobility college attendance was believed to provide. Indeed, the hijinks of campus social life were often seen as a sign that a son or daughter had become part of the secular elite. Despite persistent discrimination from predominantly white institutions, African Americans couldn't resist the pull of college life. While most attended what are now known as HBCUs, even football stars such as Paul Robeson of Rutgers, as well as Jackie Robinson of UCLA, were featured in mainstream newspaper profiles from time to time. In 1939-1940, American college enrollment stood at just under 1.5 million students. Certainly, World War II brought a dramatic dip in college enrollment, but that dip was only temporary. By 1949, college enrollment had ballooned to 2.7 million, an 80% increase within a decade. And this, call, and this was no fluke. 3.6 million were enrolled by 1960, and the maturation of the baby boom generation caused college enrollments to more than double to over 7.9 million in 1970. One area of undergraduate life that actually reached its nadir in the 1950s was intercollegiate athletics. Between 1948 and 1952, college presidents struggled in vain with attempting to draft a satisfactory code of conduct for athletes and athletic administrators. Led by the University of Virginia, academically strong institutions with relatively clean varsity sports programs resented any external body's intrusion into university policies. At the other extreme, Many colleges and university presidents relished big-time sports and its system of special privileges for athletes, thus balking at any measures that would threaten their sports powerhouses. The compromise was the formation of the NCAA as a regulatory body, which ultimately had the effect of propelling the momentum of big-time college athletics and promote an economic cartel for decades to come. By the 1960s, American higher education was a collectively massive enterprise, one that failed to sufficiently manage and or mitigate on the whole the various forms of student rebellion fomented on college campuses, including the anti-war, civil rights, and women right, women's rights movements in the backdrop of faculty clamoring for wide-ranging academic freedom. By 1970, one piece of conventional wisdom was that the prototypical American university was under duress because its center had failed to hold. However, the problem was not that the center had failed to hold, but that the modern American university now had no center at all. Gone were any vestiges of the missionary zeal of the 17th and 18th century founders and 19th century clerical college presidents and clergymen board members. Rutgers was designated the State University of New Jersey by acts of the New Jersey legislature in 1945 and 1956. Although Rutgers had become a public university as the successor to the private college founded and chartered in 1766, it still retained some important private rights and protections from unilateral state efforts to change its fundamental character and mission. Despite being one of the nine colonial colleges, and likely due to its transfer, transformation into a land-grant institution in the 19th century, Rutgers was not considered part of the Ivy League, a formerly loose association of the seven other colonial colleges, excluding the Southern William and Mary, and of course Rutgers, but including Cornell. This eight-member association of academically prestigious institutions, largely of Protestant foundational origins, also known by sports writers as the Ancient Eight, was finally formalized into an athletic conference in 1956. Even with the formation of the Ivy League in 1956, the landscape of major college athletics left the Ivies woefully behind. The overall collegiate culture of the Ivies as football schools lagged as they were still only going co-ed as late as the 1970s and early 1980s, and their enrollments as part and parcel of their exclusivity remained comparatively small. Now to be sure, the Ivy League schools had among the world's largest financial endowments, 
but in post-World War II intercollegiate athletics, their global prestige did not necessarily translate to the playing field. Even prior to the official formation of the Ivy League, the Ivy Group Agreement among member schools stipulated the following. The members of the group reaffirm their prohibition of athletic scholarships. Athletes shall be admitted as students and awarded financial aid only on the basis of the same academic standards and economic need as are applied to all other students. This prohibition of athletic scholarships would prevent the Ivies from remaining consistently competitive with big time college football programs, all of who did offer such scholarships. The writing on the wall was displayed by a turning of tables in the Princeton Rutgers rivalry. Princeton, who had historically dominated the intermittent series with Rutgers, was defeated decisively in their 1958 matchup by a score of 28 to nothing. The 1974 contest that ended in a controversial 6-6 tie would be the last competitive game as Rutgers won the next three, including their final matchup in the 1970s, which was a 24 to nothing lopsided affair where Princeton suffered six or seven serious injuries. On the wings of this defeat and Rutgers participating in the arms race to be competitive with its future scheduled opponents as of 1979, which included Penn State, Alabama, and Tennessee, it was Princeton who would make the decision to end the 110-year-old sporadic rivalry with Rutgers. The New York Times quoted Princeton athletic director and former Princeton running back Royce Flippin as stating, our move was based on Rutgers' decision to play the top state schools such as Penn State and Alabama, which were ranked one and two for a while last season. This is in no way a criticism of Rutgers, however. We applaud that what they are doing, but is a trend that we cannot go in that direction. We have to recognize that things, the things that go into a big time football program, we don't have. Unusual indeed to hear a Princeton alumnus not referring to the school as being in the top of, or big time in any category pertaining to any aspect of American colleges and universities. It wasn't until 1896 when Lafayette College was the first non-colonial college to win a share of a football national championship and 1901 until Michigan became the first public school to win a share of a national championship. But the Ivy League and William and Mary moving into the lower division of major college football in 1981 marked the end of an era where the Protestant schools introduced intercollegiate athletics to the United States in their quest of muscular Christianity and until about the outbreak of World War I, World War I dominated them, notably in football. In 1991, Rutgers would join the Big East Conference already containing other large Northeastern big-time football schools, including Syracuse University, originally the Methodist Genesee College, the University of Pittsburgh, originally private and chartered to be the Western Pennsylvania sister institution to the University of Pennsylvania, and the Jesuit Boston College. Rutgers would ultimately move to the Big Ten Conference in 2014. My research opens up a door for future exploration on if this was truly the end of a university steeped in Christian foundations can dominate in college football. Even with the split into a Division 1A and 1AA, now FBS and FCS, Brigham Young University won the big time Division 1A football national championship in 1984, and the University of Notre Dame won the last of its undisputed national championships in 1988. Once shunned by the Big Ten Conference due to its Catholic orientation, Notre Dame football remains courted by major football conferences, and BYU football will join the Big 12 Conference for the 2023-24 football season. In 1971, the Reverend Jerry Falwell opened Lynchburg Baptist College, now Liberty University, and made no secret of his ambition for his school to be the Protestant Notre Dame. Liberty's football program became a Division I FCS program in 1988, moved up to FBS in 2018 and will be joining a major football conference, Conference USA, for the 2023-24 season. So in sum, the history has yet to be written as to whether a Christ-centered university can once again have its football program move to the forefront of American football and pop culture.